Perfect. All right. So thank you everyone for um, coming coming in and spending your, your evening with me for the next hour. Um, I am aware that the goal is for me to kind of speak for a maximum of, of 40 minutes and then allow um, 15 to 20 minutes at the end for questions. So I think it will work best if we um, if we hold off the questions till the end, but if you, you can post them in the chat box as we go along so you don't forget them. Um, and then yeah, I'm happy to, to scroll through them at the end and answer as many as I can. Um, so today we're going to talk about um, what are specific learning disorders or uh, learning disabilities they've historically been referred to as, what are reasonable adjustments um, in, in class-based learning and assessment tasks and in, um, in exams for students with SLD. Um, then we're going to talk about the VCAR special provision policy. And so for students with uh, learning disabilities, in order to um, have special provisions in their year 12 exams, such as additional working time or, or use of um, assistive technology, um, that application has to be made by the school um, to the VCAR. So we're just going to talk around some of the specifics of that um, and, um, and, and the application for students with, with SLD and, and what the VCAR is looking for. Um, so first of all, just kind of quickly, what, what is a learning disorder? Um, what are the different subtypes and characteristics? So first of all, um, when we talk about a learning difficulty, um, the outcome is below average academic achievement. So that, that is the symptom, that is the observable behaviour that is certainly, um, that is usually kind of the first sign that something's um, maybe not going quite right for this student. Um, but with learning difficulties, that's a very broad umbrella term. Um, and so the reason behind the student's learning difficulties could be one or more of, of multiple different factors. So there could be emotional difficulties like anxiety, which we know that interferes with memory and concentration. There could be attentional problems. Um, there could be hearing or vision impairments that maybe haven't been picked up. Um, there could be English second language. And so they're obviously having a difficulty understanding the actual instruction and, and comprehending what they're reading. Um, there could be global developmental delay that um, means that they have quite low cognitive ability, which means that that learning is, is likely to be to be slow and, um, and, and take more time um, and support for them. Um, so that's what we for, um, refer to as learning difficulty. Um, but when we talk about a specific learning disorder, um, if we go again, so a specific learning disorder would really fall under that category of learning difficulty as well. Can be um, one reason for the below, can be a reason for the below average academic achievement. So the outcome is the same as in a learning difficulty, um, but the cause is understood to be quite different. So it's the result of impairment or in one or more of the basic psychological processes related to learning. So, so what do we mean about psychological processes? Really, that term refers to, to cognitive processing abilities. So um, I'm sure people here have probably heard about important cognitive abilities for literacy and numeracy development, such as um, phonological awareness, um, working memory, processing speed. Um, so these are the kind of, so it's a neurologically based disorder um, that, that is the result of underlying um, specific cognitive weaknesses rather than general, a general cognitive um, deficit. Um, sorry, so, um, so for students with specific learning disorders, their, their learning difficulties cannot be attributed to those external causes that I outlined on the previous slide. That's not to say that those things might not also be present, that they obviously can. We know that students with SLD can have attention difficulties. They obviously um, can experience anxiety. They are um, often at a greater risk for anxiety. Um, so, but really the, the, um, what's determined is that um, the, the SLD is the primary reason for the learning difficulties. Um, so what I forgot to say as well with that previous slide, um, I'll just jump back quickly, is the understanding is that once you kind of identify what this external cause is and you rectify that, such as um, getting glasses or hearing aids, um, managing, putting in behavioural strategies uh, um, to manage their attention difficulties, modifying task demands in order to accommodate for that, and they're given appropriate remediation and support, then they, their achievement should um, get back to the level that we would typically expect um, for their age and grade. But with SLD, because it is um, neurologically based, it's brain based, um, it, it tends to be 
uh, resistant to intervention. So while certainly their, their literacy or their numeracy school, uh, skills can progress, um, over the course of, of their schooling years. And obviously intervention is really important um, it, at a minimum, at least to, to guard against just the gap between them and their peers just getting larger and larger and larger. Um, their, their difficulties are likely to be resistant to intervention and will persist into adulthood. So these are lifelong um, conditions. The other really important thing to realise about SLD is that the learning difficulties are considered unexpected. Um, and you can interpret that in a few ways. So unexpected um, is really in relation to um, their, their general intellectual ability. So the students, most definitions of SLD um, require that the student's general level of intelligence, their general ability to think and reason is at least average for their age. And for some kids, it can be above average. Um, so you can be gifted and also have, have a learning disability. Um, so the academic difficulties in, in reading or writing or math, um, the below average academic achievement is really unexpected in relation to what we would expect based on their level of intelligence. Um, and often just more kind of naturally, these, these kids often just kind of produce, um, present a, um, a, 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 a cause some confusion to some of the adults around them. So, um, you know, you'll hear teachers say, you know, when we're in class discussion, they're, they're so wonderful in the way they're able to contribute and their ideas are extensive and their vocabulary is, is um, wonderful. But then you look at their written essay and it's just nowhere near that. You know, I know they're not um, representing what they're actually they're able to do verbally in their written work or you speak to them and they're really uh, verbal and knowledgeable and then you listen to them read and it's so um, <clears throat> laborious and mechanical and and slow um, and so it just kind of it just doesn't match up um, with these kids um, <clears throat> So to kind of bring that all together, this is a really nice um, definition of SLD that actually um, was originally stated in the 1960s, but I think is, is um, for me, it's one of the kind of clearest um, definitions of SLD that I've come across. <coughs> Sorry, I'm going to take a little sip quickly. So it says at the very core of the concept of learning disability is the assumption that if not for the presence of an underlying cognitive deficit, so that working memory, that phonological awareness, um, which is affecting acquisition or development of a specific academic skill, an individual would be able to perform and learn that skill satisfactorily because he or she displays the capacity to do so in other cognitive and academic skills area. So that's just really operationalizing that understanding that they have the cognitive capacity, their general level of intelligence is, um, is average or even potentially above. Um, but just because of those specific cognitive processing weaknesses, um, learning some basic academic skills such as word reading, accuracy, reading fluency, spelling um, is really, really difficult for them. So, so the, um, and then often the, the academic difficulties tend to be specific as well. So, um, while you can have learning disabilities in reading and writing and math, um, you, you can just have a learning disability in one or just two. So they might be really advanced in math, but really struggling in the area of literacy. So again, um, it's that un, unexpected underachievement in relation to their cognitive ability in relation to their achievement um, in other academic areas. Um, so because these students, you know, have, have that general cognitive capacity that, that is that general intelligence that it is at least average, um, they ought to be able to perform academically at a level that approximates that of his or her more typically achieving peers, but when provided with individualised instruction and as well as appropriate accommodations. So really we need to work with these students from the um, from the understanding that they have the capacity, um, but we're just gonna to need to provide some adjustments in the way we present information to them or the way um, they are asked to demonstrate their knowledge that get around those areas of specific cognitive processing weakness. And that, that's really what we're gonna talk about today. Um, so we really wanna come, we don't wanna lower our expectations for these students um, because we do know from research that um, expectations and beliefs held by significant people around a student um, can, can influence outcomes regardless of their accuracy. 
Um, so this is typically how we view the different types of learning disabilities. So this model is based off the DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which is um, really the handbook used by a range of professionals such as psychologists and psychiatrists to um, identify mental health conditions. Um, so they have the category specific learning disorder, which is the umbrella term, and then that's subdivided into the areas of reading, written expression, and math. Um, and so within each area, they can have weaknesses in one or more of these specific skills. So under reading, um, it's, it's difficulties with the reading rate or fluency, difficulties with word reading accuracy. And when you've got um, one or two of those, then you tend to also have a negative flow and effect to their reading comprehension. Under written expression, they can have difficulty with spelling, grammar and punctuation accuracy, um, and the clarity or organisation of their written expression. So actually putting together a well-structured writing piece. Um, and then when you've got this pattern of where they've got difficulties in word reading accuracy and or fluency, as well as spelling, um, that's what's typically referred to as dyslexia. Um, and then downing maths. They can have difficulties in one or more of these areas. Number sense, um, memorization of arithmetic facts, so um, automatic recall of basic addition, subtraction, multiplication, um, accurate or fluent calculation. You'll have some students that are very accurate in their calculations, but they're incredibly slow. Um, and then um, you can have difficulties with maths reasoning as well. And when we get this pattern of difficulties with um, basic arithmetic facts, and accurate and fluid calculations. That's um, what we can refer to as dyscalculia. Um, difficulties under the written expression domain often get referred to as dysgraphia as well. For some reason, the DSM-5 didn't include that term as well. I don't really understand why, um, but I'm sure some of you have probably heard of this SLD and written expression being, being referred to as dysgraphia. Um, those dysgraphia can take two forms. There's the, in terms of the spelling and the grammar and punctuation and the um, clarity and organisation of written expression, but also then there's more emotor-based dysgraphia that sometimes gets referred to as dyspraxia or developmental coordination disorder, which is difficulty with the actual physical act of um, handwriting and letter formation. And they can certainly co-occur. So a, a language-based writing difficulty and a physically motor-based writing difficulty. Um, so I'm not going to go through this slide in detail, um, but these are just some of the characteristics that secondary school students with SLD might demonstrate. So these might be some of the warning signs or the red flags um, that get picked up by parents or, or schools um, that suggest that maybe um, an assessment uh, might, be, might be beneficial to, to understand what's going on. And I will make these slides. Um, uh, is that possible, Michael, for these slides to be shared with everyone yeah. afterwards? Yes, we're attempting to. We're, I've started a, a YouTube page for LDA. Um, mm -hmm. It's very basic at the moment because my computer skills aren't wonderful. But um, uh, we have put the last two up as links at this stage, which go off to where else, where they're, they're where they're stored. But mm -hmm. we will be attempting to put this recording uh, straight up onto our. Um, YouTube page channel. Okay, yeah. wonderful. Wonderful. Um, so before we move on to the next section, I just want to make a really quick comment about the link between um, learning disabilities and mental health. Um, so we do know that individuals who, students who experience learning difficulties and, and those who experience SLD, such as dyslexia and so on, um, have do have a greater risk of, of mental health conditions such as anxiety and depression. And you know, that's really not, I'm sure that's not surprising to anyone because children spend a lot of their, uh, their, their day and their weeks in school. And um, if it's a place where they're um, not feeling confident, they're feeling that they're, um, you know, regularly failing and unsuccessful, um, they're, they're misunderstood by the teacher potentially, possibly being viewed as um, just not trying hard enough when, you know, you can imagine how heartbreaking that would be for someone who's been told they, they just need to try harder or listen more carefully, um, but they actually have an underlying learning disability that, that is making it very, very difficult for them. So it's, it's not uncommon for these kids to develop anxiety and depression. And then we have to realise that this 
negative cycle can develop. Learning difficulties cause anxiety, for example. Uh, the anxiety exacerbates the learning difficulties or the anxiety causes them to try and avoid learning activities because that's a common response to when we're feeling anxious to avoid the activity or the situation that's causing us anxiety. And then through avoidance, their, their learning difficulties are, 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 um, are, are um, getting greater because they're not engaging in regular learning. And so, um, so that's why it's really, really important that we get in early with these kids. You know, we know that we can screen kids um, in preschool and in prep for the risk factors for um, dyslexia. Um, and, and we can do the same with maths as well, um, screening them for number sense. Um, and so I'm sure I'm, I'm preaching to the converted here um, that, you know, the sooner we can identify these kids and give them the intervention that um, means, you know, that because SLD is, is lifelong and is resistant to intervention, you know, it's, it's often um, that the, the expectation is not um, that they're never going to have these difficulties, but the goal is that their difficulties will not be as severe as they would have otherwise if we um, missed that. that um, time for early intervention. So we want to get in and give them the support um, so that helps them to feel confident and capable um, and and ho ho um, hopefully avoid um, this development of mental health difficulties that exacerbates the learning difficulties. Um, okay, so now that we have a bit of an understanding of SLD, um, what are some reasonable adjustments that can be provided for them in school? Um, I'm sure this, a lot of people here have seen this, this um, graphic um, just showing that how, you know, you can't have the same exam conditions or the same exam requirements um, for, for everyone, that certain animals are, are going to be greatly disadvantaged if, if they're asked to climb a tree. Um, and so it's just important as well to realise the difference between equality and equity. So equality, everyone gets the same, regardless of their individual characteristics, whereas equity is that we provide the additional supports and the, the slight adjustments um, that allow everyone to participate in the activity equally. And so that's what we're really aiming for um, with reasonable adjustments. Um, so, in Australia, students with disabilities such as SLD are protected under the Disability Discrimination Act and the Disability Standards for Education, um, which says that they, um, they are um, to be provided with reasonable adjustments that support their learning. And these adjustments um, are to be developed in consultation with the student, their parent, guardian or, or carer. So working with the school, the student and the parents to identify um, most reasonable, um, what are the relevant reasonable adjustments that they require in order to be able to f fully participate in um, the curriculum and of course as well as um, other activities. So just like if you had a student with a physical disability that meant that they were in a wheelchair, you would provide a, a ramp so they can enter the classroom and engage in the teaching and learning and just, and as, just as much as everyone else. And this is the same, same for students with learning disabilities but um, uh, because they're they're rather invisible in a way compared to, to other disabilities. Um, it, it might mean that we just need to um, advocate um, a bit harder to, to get those reasonable adjustments um, implemented. <clears throat> so this is just a nice framework that I like to use when thinking about not just for students with SLD, um, but um, any student who might require adjustments um, at school in order to, to fully participate. So we've got four different types of um, adjust, educational adjustments. So we can modify, we can accommodate, we can remediate, or we can compensate. Um, so modify is when we change the content or we change the difficulty level of the work. So we might reduce the difficulty level, give the student um, math work at a lower grade level. We can modify up and make it more difficult for students who are, um, you know, need to be extended in certain academic areas. We can modify up. Um, and so for students with SLD, generally speaking, we, we don't want to modify because we don't want to lower those academic expectations. Um, so we're not actually changing the content or the difficulty level. Um, we're just providing accommodations that change the way information is delivered 
or we change the way that they demonstrate their knowledge. So for example, um, we might change from them being required to read a book chapter to being able to listen to that book chapter um, in an audio book. So using um, text to speech technology. So they're still learning the same thing as everyone else, but for a student with dyslexia who has word reading um, accuracy and fluency difficulties, um, they're, they're gonna really struggle to, to comprehend what they're reading um, or it's gonna take them an incredibly long time. So we just change the way that they receive that information. Um, we also accommodate, provide accommodations um, in assessment. So we might give them additional reading time. We might allow them to use um, that, that text to speech technology in exams or um, historically we've had, you know, um, someone in the school read out the questions to them and so on. Um, we might have a, allow them to use a laptop and, and we'll get into these accommodations um, a bit more soon. Um, the other thing that we can do is we can remediate, we can target the area uh, and generally we're talking about academic areas here. Oh, what just happened there? Woo. Are we still here? Uh, you were, but we've just oh. lost your... Um... Oh God, here we go. Oh, my computer. Are we back? <laughs> that was you're, scary. You're on. You're we, we can't see your screen. Um, okay. I think I've got it here now. Can yes. you see that? That's the yep, cool screen. Yep. Okay. Wow. Don't know what happened there. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> um, I should say as well, this model is um, has the acronym MARC for Modify, Accommodate, Remediate and Compensate. Um, and the reference for it is there. Um, so remediate is when we target that um, generally the academic difficulties and we, we strengthen them. So this is, um, you know, structured synthetic phonics programs for reading and spelling. This is direct instruction. This is evidence-based um, intervention. Um, so we're, we're targeting the academic areas. There's programs out there that say that they, you know, strengthen working memory and so on. Um, the research doesn't support that. So I really advocate for rem um, um, remediation of academic areas of difficulty. Um, and the final one is compensate, where we help the individual come up with strategies that bypass the deficit. And these are the ones that are more appropriate for areas of cognitive weakness, like, um, like working memory and processing speed. So um, we work with the student to develop a number of memory aids that compensate for working memory difficulties. Maybe they um, uh, take pictures of the board, um, they um, record uh, lectures or, or classes so they don't have to divide their attention and do note taking and listening at the same time. Um, they use visual schedules if they're having trouble with um, um, remembering um, the, the routine of the day and, and organisational aids and things like that. So for students with SLD it is often those compensatory strategies are really important. Like I said, the modify is generally not the appropriate method because we don't want to change the difficulty level of the work. Um, often the, the main modification for students with SLD in high school is that they're um, excluded, they, um, excused, I should say, from um, learning a second language. So they can use that time to participate in, a, in an additional literacy support class, for example. That, that would be a modification to their um, to their curriculum. Um, but so generally for students with SLD, it is this balancing act between remediation um, and accommodation. Um, and so, you know, I'm just, I'm not gonna read this out word for word, um, but so with um, remediation, there are certainly evidence-based approaches that we um, want schools and, and private tutoring services to be using. In terms of accommodations, we can provide instructional accommodations. So in the way that we teach information and share information, um, write instructions down for them, break tasks down into small steps, so on. We can provide environmental accommodations. So it's allowing them to sit in, the, take the exam in a separate room in a quiet setting. Um, and there are an assessment accommodations in terms of extended time using speech to text, text to speech, laptop, um, so on. So it is this balancing act and, um, and the weight we place on each, you know, really changes um, over the course of, um, of a student's um, 
um, life. And like I said before, you know, the earlier we can get in with the remediation, the better. Um, and then generally I say it's kind of around grade three when you have that, you know, that shift in the curriculum from learning to read to reading to learn that you'd start to introduce those accommodations, you know, in an ideal world. By the time we get to the end of um, primary school, the student would be really confident um, in using certain accommodations such as speech to text, um, asking um, and would have the um, self-advocacy skills to be able to request that the teacher write the instructions down on the board or that they'd be allowed to take pictures of the board, things like that. So then by the time they start high school, they've really got a handle on the accommodations um, and they can really hit the ground running um, in high school. Obviously, that doesn't always work out that way, um, but that's kind of what I see as the, the ideal um, pathway for, for students with SLD. Um, but again, of course, you know, as well, it's not a one size fits all and we need to take into account um, the individual and their particular circumstances um, as well. Um, so assistive technology is, you know, really important for students with SLD. It really is, is the way forward um, in terms of speech to text, text to speech, so on. So this is a really great handout from, from Ausfeld in terms of the different types of assistive technology out there, um, which um, I won't read that out, but just as some examples, you know, of text to speech assistive technology. So where it reads out the text for them, whether it's a book or on a website or things like that. Um, there's, you know, that's a program that can be on the, the computer or the, or the iPad. This is um, the C pen that can be used in class easily and in exams. Um, there's, there's other programs out there as well. Um, and there are free inbuilt features in, in Mac and PC. Um, speech to text where they talk and it gets written down for them. So for individuals with writing difficulties, this can potentially be helpful. So Dragon is a very, Dragon Naturally Speaking is, is very well known. There's Word to Speak. I'm sure there's many people here who um, could, could list off an, a number of additional programs that they've found very helpful. Um, and again, there's inbuilt features in, in a, a number of different platforms. Um, so I kind of said before, kind of this is what I see as the ideal journey of a student with SLD, that their academic difficulties are identified early in primary school and they're provided that remediation. Um, and then um, by middle primary school would, is, would usually be the time that you might refer for um, a, a psychological assessment because the difficulties have, have been observed to persist despite the, uh, the remediation efforts. Um, and so an SLD is then identified if appropriate and that's when you start to balance that remediation with accommodations. And so by late primary school there, um, because it is a trial and error process with accommodations, it's not a one size fits all. So you have to be prepared to go through that process of trialing different things. Certainly some students aren't comfortable using certain accommodations in the classroom. So it is really about working with the student um, and, and maybe not pushing them too, too fast, too soon. Um, and, and so really taking that time to, to go through that trial and error process. And then ideally by the time they start secondary school, they do know what works for them. They understand why they need to use these particular accommodations um, and they can use them independently and they can you know, advocate for themselves with um, the range of different teachers that they have. Um, and then, you know, and by the time they start secondary school as well, the, school, the secondary school can start with the knowledge of what their particular needs in are. They can start gathering that evidence in anticipation of a special exam arrangements application to VCAR. Um, schools can submit for SLD. There is the option to submit an application early from year nine onwards, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and then the ideal outcome is that they complete their, their VCE exams um, to the best of their ability because they've been given the appropriate accommodations. Um, so this is what I would see as the ideal journey for a student with SLD, but you know, in reality, that's obviously gonna um, greatly differ. Um, and it could differ for many reasons that, um, you know, the school, they, the primary school they were in didn't have, a, um, you know, screening practices in place that helped to identify them. Um, maybe there were family issues going on that um, meant there were, there were kind of bigger issues in the family to deal with and, and the, the learning of the child kind of got pushed aside. You know, there could be many, many reasons. So in, in a lot of cases, 
a, a student might not get identified as having an SLD until they're in higher school. And certainly with those um, higher ability students, sometimes it doesn't get picked up till year 11, um, you know, only when those academic demands really um, jump up, um, are they no longer able to compensate. So. Um, so this is, you know, a tricky situation for high schools. I think with the with the VCAR process, is sometimes they've got to really kind of try and get this application together, get the evidence together, um, when it's only been something that that's recently been identified. So let's go on to VCAR. Um, so VCAR. Um, so the special provision policy um, is to allow. Um, adequate opportunity for individuals with certain disabilities to demonstrate their, their capabilities. Um, and so you can have a look at the, the VCAR have recently um, updated their website and it's a lot more user friendly now. So um, I suggest you, if you haven't been there in a while, um, that, that you visit the website and, and have a look at everything. So VCAR actually went through um, a review process um, that um, resulted in um, some advisory groups being formed and I actually participated in the SLD advisory group and um, out of that was an updated VCAR special provision policy which came into effect in 2018. Um, so it is possible as well that some schools aren't aware of some of the changes that have come about in the last couple of years um, which I'm going to outline now. Um, so um, so schools are responsible for determining um, eligibility and the nature of provisions that they grant for classroom learning and school-based assessment. So all classroom learning reasonable adjustments or um, VCAR refers to special provision. It's, it's the same as reasonable adjustments or accommodations. I might accidentally um, swap between that different terminology, but we're talking about the same thing. Um, up until um, your, uh, well, all through um, high school, it's uh, the school's decision as to what adjustments are provided in the classroom. Um, and then up to year 11 um, and in school assessments. Um, but for those year 12 VC exams, that's when um, the application has to go to VCAR in order to get special provisions um, in those instances. Um, and so the VCAR, if you look at their website, they say about 20 million times, you know, that schools are encouraged to call them and consult with them on individual cases if they're not sure about what appropriate adjustments might be and what evidence they can submit. Um, <clears throat> so, but the VCAR, while it's up to the school to decide what provisions they provide students with, um, they're encouraged to provide those that are likely to be consistent with what the VCAR will approve for year 12 exams. Um, so obviously schools need to be aware of what, what the provisions are. Um, schools are required to document and communicate all decisions around special provisions and keep records of all the decisions that they made along the way for a student. Um, and a lot of that can be submitted um, as part of the educational evidence in VCAR applications. Um, but it is ultimately the VCAR who determines that eligibility in, in year 12 exams. Um, so this was a big change that came about with the new um, provisions in 2018 was the use of assistive um, speech to text, um, sorry, text to speech, potentially speech to text. I think that that kind of function, the feedback I tend to get is that it doesn't work as well. Um, so maybe there's still some more advancements to say there. Um, and so they, um, you know, so the school, VCAR do consider that, that schools have the responsibility to ensure that assistive technology is available. Um, but because this area is so um, fast paced and there's constantly new things, they do encourage schools to consult with the VCAR um, if they're going to um, allow a student to use a new or emerging technology. <clears throat> So it's the school who makes the application and just because a, a student has a diagnosis of an SLD or um, some of the other um, conditions that they approve provisions for doesn't automatically entitle them to special provisions. So it's really about being able to demonstrate that functional impact, that disadvantage, um, that uh, negative impact on their performance when they um, are required to sit um, a, a exams without special provisions. Um, and so I won't go, this is just the process that VCAR um, gave out about um, that it's really um, the school that, that makes the application. 
Um, so VCAR considers the application on the basis of three things. So independent professional and or educational and academic assessments, any school-based evidence and recommendations provided with the application. And I get asked a lot, what is the school-based evidence? So we'll talk about that. Um, and then it's the VCAR zone assessment. So they bring all that information together, they have a panel um, and they make a decision. Um, so this was one of the big changes that came about with the policy update in 2018, that for long-term or permanent conditions, which SLZ is considered, it's a lifelong condition, um, schools can submit a formal early application from year nine onwards. Um, and this decision was made because of the feedback the VCAR um, received um, that schools were unsure as to whether provide, to provide special provisions in year nine, year 10 and year 11 um, when you know they didn't know if the student was going to get that in year 12 and so would they actually be disadvantaging the student because they'd done all their exams for the previous few years with additional reading time or use of the laptop or so on but then they weren't going to be approved that in, in year 12. Um, and so that uncertainty is I can understand the school situation, position, and, uh, and obviously can understand the frustration of the students and the parents that that, that caused. Um, so they're saying for these permanent conditions, submit your application from year nine, that it can be approved and then you can have certainty um, about what that um, those special provisions will be in year 10. And it's up to the school, once it's approved from early on, um, it would be up to the school to um, contact VCAR um, to say if, if the situation changed. Um, so, for example, if they suddenly didn't have dyslexia anymore and they didn't need additional reading time, you know, that's not going to happen um, because this is a lifelong condition. So really to be more likely that maybe their situation has worsened and they needed more accommodations um, before. So, um, so it's, of, it's important to realise that this is for long-term and permanent conditions. So things like anxiety, which can be transitory, um, you can't um, submit an app early application for that, but, but things like language disorders, SLD, um, you can. So what, what the, the applications look like from 2018 and beyond? Um, so there's a number of conditions that you can apply for special provisions under, um, and we're just going to focus on that specific learning disorder. Um, but really with, with mental health conditions like um, anxiety and ADHD and language disorders as well, the educational evidence, um, well for all of them really, the educational evidence would be the same. But we're going to talk about some of the specifics around SLD. So the VCA has adopted this definition of SLD um, and it's up on their website, which um, identifies the you know, specific areas that students might have um, difficulties in. And this, this definition was taken from the DSM. Um, so it's consistent with that. These are the possible provisions they say now. Um, so for impairment in reading, which includes dyslexia, Schools could request extra working time, use of a reader, or use of that assistive technology. So this is definitely something that is new since 2018. For impairment in written expression, extra working time, use of a computer, or possibly a, a, a person to scribe for them, um, or use of assistive technology. Um, and for maths, it could be extra working time, use of a computer, I'm not sure if that would actually be helpful. They put use of assistive technology there as well. I'm not really um, sure what that assistive technology would be. Um, in maths exams where a calculator is not allowed, I really don't see a time when VCAR would allow a student to use a calculator because of an SLD in maths. So I think that's just something that needs to be taken into consideration when selecting subjects. Um, but really it's the extra working time. When you talk to students with dyscalculia and you say, what, what do you want, what do you need? It's just, it's just that additional time. Um, but I think they just put that under there um, to, to just be consistent and to keep it open for the future because this area of assistive technology just keeps um, advancing. I think it's really important to realise that a student doesn't actually have to formally have a diagnosis to apply for um, provisions under these different areas. And often you have students with dyslexia who apply for use of a computer um, and, and that's fine. So it's really more about what are the provisions that they 
needs, the adjustments, and then you apply under that category and you can apply under, under multiple ones. Um, that, and sorry, that was a big change as well, that prior to 2018, um, an SLD in maths wasn't specifically mentioned um, in the VCAR special provisions policy um, and, and now it is. So what are the evidence requirements for these applications? I'm really conscious of the time and I, it says I've got five slides to go, so I'm trying to get through. Do we have a lot of questions, Michael, or? No, not too many, Kate. Okay, great. Um, so for all SLD subtypes, so whether it's that reading, that writing, or that math, VCAR does require that a cognitive assessment or an IQ test um, is completed. And that test has to be administered from grade six onwards. Um, so prior to 2018, the requirement was from year seven onwards. Um, so this was a change that came in um, <clears throat> based on the feedback um, that a lot of families, you know, want to get an assessment um, in grade six um, in order to support that transition to high school. For students with SLD, it can be really helpful to have a comprehensive psychological assessment in grade six um, to just reconfirm kind of the, the extent of the certain difficulties that they have and to provide recommendations for school in terms of reasonable adjustments. Um, so some families are having to make that decision between, well, do I get the assessment now, knowing that it could help um, make that transition to high school smoother, or do I wait till year seven so that assessment can be used for the VCAR application? So now um, from grade six onwards, um, that, that cognitive test can be administered. Um, and that is really just that cognitive assessment is really just about um, determining that this is a student that would benefit from adjustments, that they have the cognitive capacity um, to understand the, the content at their year level um, and so providing reasonable adjustments, um, and providing special provisions um, would likely be beneficial. So if they have an impairment in reading and you're requesting extra working time, use of a reader or use of that text to speech technology, then the school has to administer the PAT-R, which is a, a reading comprehension test. But now the VCAR also says that they will look at the results of additional reading measures. So such as the YARC, which is a, a, a common one that schools use um, and, and psychologists use and educational specialists use, or they say, or other reading tests administered if available. Um, you know, and I think this is really a recognition that the PADAR is just a test of reading comprehension and it doesn't, really, doesn't specifically assess word reading accuracy or reading fluency. It's a multiple choice test as well, which is actually different to, to often um, the reading requirements of exams. Um, so you can definitely have those kids with dyslexia who come out average on the PADAR but when you look at results of other tests, which kind of more do a more fine-grained analysis of those reading skills that, that work together to support comprehension, they can come out, you know, real, so the YARC separates it into kind of single word reading accuracy. There's a reading rate um, or reading fluency and, and a reading comprehension. Um, and you do have those kids who, who still compensate and comprehend, so they come out average on comprehension, their fluency might at the you know the second percentile. Um, so I think it's really up when when you've got that discrepancy between the PADR and these other tests and other reading tests could be the Wyatt's, which is what a lot of um, psychologists use. Um, there's Woodcock Johnson tests as well. Um, you know I think it's just it's um, important to really make that clear in the application um, that yes you know they come out um, average in their reading in their reading on the PADR, but you know look at the significant difficulties. Um, that, that it, um, are demonstrated by the performance on this other test. And then the school has the opportunity to say, and this is really consistent with what we observe during um, school-based assessments. Um, for impairment in written expression, where you're requesting extra working time, use of a computer, scribe or, or assistive technology. Um, so there's, there's up to three different essays that um, the student completes that the school um, submits and you do just the first two if you're only asking for additional working time and you do a third one if you're asking for a computer assistive technology um, or a scribe. Um, and so there's, there's um, English um, teachers in the VCAR who assess those three, um, two to three 
um, essays to, to see um, if there's a noticeable improvement in the student's performance when they are provided with certain special provisions such as additional time or, or a computer. Um, and teachers are encouraged to, to write their um, observations on these um, essays as well in terms of, um, you know, they were really exhausted, um, they, um, they required, um, you know, um, one and a half times the amount of time of other students um, to, to complete the same amount of work or um, things like that. And then so math is a new area that, that the VCAR has included in the last couple of years. So if you're requesting that additional time, use of a computer, which I don't really know what that means, and use of assistive technology, which I don't really know what that means. Um, so what the VCAR has said, so while they've kind of got this mandatory test for reading, this kind of standardised assessment that everyone does, and then with writing, they've got these set um, two to three essays that everyone does and they've, they've got the criteria that they assess that against. There's not really something equivalent in the maths area. There's not really a kind of universally accepted test um, that does a good job at, at identifying maths difficulties. So in this instance, they're saying, you know, schools need to um, provide examples of maths assessment completed at school by the student um, and examples of both with and without the special provisions. Um, and detailing any provisions utilised by the student and the time um, it took them. Um, and then they're also asking for study specific teacher observations of student difficulties during assessments and in class. So this is really the math teacher um, who says, you know, that, um, that I've consistently observed them to take double the amount of time um, to get through the, the same amount of work as other students. I've observed them to be, to, to um, lack automaticity in their basic arithmetic, which really slows them down. If they don't have access to a computer, a calculator, they're much slower. You know, so it's all these, these teacher observations. So the VCAR, well, I guess I'll jump ahead actually, because um, I might be getting to that. So this is the school-based evidence part. So this is mandatory for all applications. And so the school is required to answer a series of questions. Um, so these are the questions that they answer. Um, and so this is really where, where the expertise of teachers and schools um, you know, can come into play. So they outline the student's condition. So they have an SLD in, in reading, uh, they have dyslexia. You know, they state when it was first observed and what changes they've observed over time. Um, what difficulties have you observed the students to experience in completing school-based assessments? Um, so in terms of having difficulty finishing it in the same amount of time as everyone else or getting really tired and needing to have rest breaks or um, again, you know, this applies for all the applications in terms of their anxiety, needing some, some um, rest time in order to implement anxiety management techniques so they can come back to the test. Um, so then they ask for what has been the history of provisions that have been approved for the student and when were they first implemented? So what school-based, i.e. teacher observations and professional evidence did you use to determine whether the student required any special provisions? So referring to psychological assessment reports that diagnosed the student with an SLD and um, provided recommendations regarding provisions. Um, but also, I, I think sometimes schools might rely on that too heavily and think that, you know, just because it's in the psych report, that, that's all that's needed. But that, that's not a guarantee. Um, and I really think that the VCAR actually values the school-based data and the teacher observations more. Um, in terms of um, regularly observing the student to run out of time, um, so on and so forth. Um, and, and then they ask how had the approved special provisions assisted the student? So, you know, detailing that when they didn't have the additional time, they were getting 56% on exams and afterwards they're getting 74%. Um, so I think this all really, you know, when, when schools ask, you know, what, what is the educational evidence? Um, I think it really links back. I think the key um, is when you look at what they've asked for under maths, where you don't have that universal assessment. And so they're asking for examples of assessment completed at school by the student with or without, with and without special provisions 
detailing any provisions that they were utilised and the time taken and study specific teacher observations of student difficulties during assessments and in class. Um, and I think what the VCA want to see is that the decision to provide a student with special provisions was data driven. It was data driven based on um, professional recommendations made by psychologists or occupational therapists or paediatricians, but also data driven based on observations of teachers um, as experts in teaching and learning um, have you know, observed these particular difficulties and then decided to trial these different um, reasonable adjustments. Um, and you know, and you can explain the story and say that well, first we tried this special provision of um, using um, text to speech um, technology, but the student actually wasn't comfortable with it. So then we went to a reader, um, and that so again, just detailing that that history of showing that it was a thought out process, it was a data driven process, um, that it's not just um, you know the school just handing out these these special provisions. Um, you know, to, to anyone, um, which obviously I, I, I don't believe occurs. Um, so yeah, just going back to where I said, you know, the VCAR considered three up these applications on the basis of, of three um, things. So that's independent, professional and or academic, um, educational academic assessments, any school-based evidence, um, and then the VCAR zone assessment. So yeah, so this part, you know, is really those previous psychological assessments and recommendations, assessments provided by any other relevant allied health professionals, such as GPs, pediatricians, OTs, speeches, um, assessments by specialist teachers and learning support staff. Um, so, you know, again, it's, I think it's just showing that it, it was a data-driven um, approach when deciding on the special provisions. Um, with the school-based evidence, so, Again, this is what I've just taken from that math um, category. So examples of assessments completed at school with and without provisions, detailing the provisions and the time taken. I've heard of a school that um, when they're kind of collecting the evidence for VCAR, they actually allow students to take as much time as they need. It, they need. So generally schools will approve that additional 10 minutes per one hour of exam, which is what VCAR generally um, approves. Um, but there's schools who um, apparently just allow as much time as the student needs and so they can make a note and say this is where they got up to in the math test having the same amount of time as everyone else and, and this is what they scored 56% but when they were allowed to take that additional half an hour their score went up to 87% so um, you know that's that data. Um, oops. Um, so again, you know, so just this is kind of linking, a bit, just reminding what that ideal journey would be, but obviously it's not the same for everyone. Um, it would be great if when, when students start high school, we know that they have a learning disability, schools can start collecting that evidence straight away, but sometimes it doesn't happen until, you know, year 10 or year 11. And so the schools might not have that time to go through that trial and error approach and, um, and collect that evidence. And, and I think just being upfront, about that um, in the application, um, you know, is helpful. Um, I think the other thing to say is, well, in terms of special provisions, and particularly assistive technology, um, you know, the VCAR wants to know that the provisions are something that the student has used and the student is comfortable with. So they don't want to approve um, text to speech technology for their year 12 exams when the students never used it before. They don't want it to be the first time they've used that piece of technology when they walk into their exam. So I think that's another important part of that school-based evidence to be able to say they've been using this special provision for the last two years um, successfully. Um, so, and, and in, if, and often, you know, when these learning disabilities do get identified late, um, then often in those instances, you, you would um, um, probably ask, for a reader um, and a scribe, you know, so to have someone read out the questions rather than to use that assistive technology because that's easier to adjust to than, than using a, a particular software program. So again, you know, what, what, re what adjustments, what special provisions are going to be provided are really dependent on the individual student and kind of the stage um, that, that they're at. Um, I was going to say something else, but I might 
kind of stop it there. And um, well, I've just got one more slide um, just to say, um, you know, those with an SLD, they just learn differently. It's not that they're unable to learn. And so our goal um, should be to provide them with the tools that they need in order to meet the academic standards with rigour equal to that of their peers. So um, minimum performance should not be um, the standard by which we measure the adolescent or adult um, population with SLD. And how did I get through? I hope I didn't, oh, right on. You're right, right, on. You're right on time. <laughs> well done, Kate. I'll just give you a break there for a second. I don't yep. know everyone whether we'll, this will cut out in the next minute because I'm not sure how our license goes after an hour. We mm. haven't been over an hour. So if, if, we, if we do get um, cut out, I'd just like to thank uh, Kate uh, in advance uh, for a wonderful session. There's such a wealth of information there. Um, it's ticked over to seven o'clock on my phone and we, we're not cut off. So mm -hmm. uh, that, that's a good sign. We might be able to answer some questions, but I would like to really thank you, Kate. There's such a, a wealth of information. Um, I might answer a couple of questions just to give you a little bit more break. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Felicity's asked with the national curriculum, how different or the same is it in other states? I've worked across a few states um, and the problem, Felicity, is that funding for disabilities is very much a state-based uh, issue for the most part, other than the NCCD. So um, different states come up with different criteria often um, for state funding. Obviously, federal disability funding is now through the nationally consistent collection of data. So there can be quite vast differences, but I think the principles that Kate outlined there are, are relevant across all states and, and for all students, particularly uh, with the federal um, NCCD. I think they're very, very pertinent and um, useful mm. for that. Um, do you want to answer a couple more? Victoria's asked, how frequently do do they need to have IQ tests every couple of years? That's no, enough. definitely not. No, definitely not. And um, so the, the rules around um, intelligence testing is generally there is a rule of thumb that you don't do it under two, you don't redo it under two years. And that's um, come about because of the Victorian Department of Education when you are using those tests for um, funding under the program for student with disabilities, they, they don't um, allow you to reassess within two years. Um, but in terms of the case of SLD, where it's not, it's not funded under the program for students with disabilities, um, I, I think it really depends on the stage that they're at. So um, I might see a grade two or a grade three student um, and, and do a comprehensive assessment and diagnose them with a learning disability. And then I'll, I'll suggest to the family that, you know, you can come back in grade six and we'll redo the whole assessment again and you'll have that report in order to support that transition to high school. It can be used in that VCAR process and really you shouldn't need to do another one again. So whether they do it in grade six or they do it in year seven or they do it in year eight, um, you know, ideally it would just be um, in, in the majority of cases, I would say one in primary school and then one from grade six up. Um, and then hopefully for SLD, it's, um, it, it shouldn't be needed again. Uh, Jan, Jan has said, read, write is a speech to text which has an Australian speaker, so easier to hear when reading. So thanks for that, Jan. Great. Yep. Um, Elaine has said, I've heard that uh, if we do not provide extra time and assessment, such as NAPLAN, that the student cannot have extra time given in high school. Is that correct? I don't believe that's correct. And like I've said, for every student, the journey is different, but the more evidence that, that can be added and provided, and I really think that that, um, you know, if, if they're a student in high school who has been identified as having significant reading difficulties, then yes, they should be getting that additional reading time um, or use of a reader um, in NAPLAN and they should be getting it in school-based assessment and things like that. But, um, I, you know, VCAR do recognise, from my conversations with VCAR in the past, they do recognise that that journey it can be very different for, for individual students and they don't want to systematically disadvantage students who don't have that long history of accommodations and reasonable adjustments. And so I think it's just something that, that the, the argument just kind of needs to be maybe a bit stronger in those applications. 
Um, and I've certainly written um, for, for clients um, of mine where I've, I've kind of written supporting statements um, to, to that effect. Um, saying, you know, please recognise that this difficulty was only recently um, identified and they don't have that history um, of accommodations, but, but they certainly require it. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, Adina has asked, uh, how, how current do tests like YARC have to be? And before you answer, I was just made aware of uh, a really great resource called MOTIF. I'm not sure if mm. you've heard of that, Kate, but mm -hmm. it's a Macquarie University um, a uh, whole lot of tests and assessments developed by Anne Castles and Genevieve MacArthur. So that the link to that is on the LDA website. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that's a great assessment uh, resource for teachers and, and other professionals, um, which I was only just made aware of. So I thought I'd just mm. share that. Uh, yeah, everybody. it tends to be for more primary age students. There's not, I don't think many of the, the tools on there um, have have norms for, for high school age students, but certainly yeah, it's some free free kind of screening yeah. um, assessments there, which is really great. Um, in terms of how recent does the YARC have to be? I'm I'm not sure, and this is probably something that I would email VCAR really quickly just to confirm. Um, so whether it kind of if, if like you made that early application in year nine would the YARC have to have been completed within the previous two years or the previous year? Um, I'm, I'm not too sure about that. Um, so, but that would definitely be something that VCAR would be able to, to answer um, very quickly. Vicky's asked um, that what you said generally SLD kids have average to high average cognitive skills. Would a student with low average and average scores in most index scores with maybe a very low score in say FRI be generally ruled out as having an SLD? And would this mean that they are not eligible for applying for the VCAA for special considerations? Mm. So in terms of the VCAR, um, when they, so when they require that cognitive assessment, really all they're doing is looking to see that the full scale IQ score is greater than 70. Um, so, so from the sounds of, of what um, that, that lady was saying, it does sound like those results would not have ruled that student out. Um, so, so there is generally, um, in terms of whether that student would receive an SLD diagnosis by a psychologist is, is a different question and it's really hard just to, to say that based on um, some scores. Um, but and not knowing um, the actual, uh, um, you know, how, how um, the child approached the tasks during testing and, and things like that, and um, if there were anxiety difficulties, things like that. Um, but in terms of VCAR, that yeah, those it doesn't sound like those scores would um, mean that they couldn't apply under that. Yeah. Sue's asked, uh, Pat Maths, question mark for maths. Why not Pat Maths? Is Pat reading? Yeah, I know because it's it's because math difficulties can be very specific. So um, you can your calculation skills and your applied problem solving skills can actually be fine, but it's just the speed, it's the math fluency, or it can be the reverse. Um, so there's not really that I know of a test that taps into all those different things um, at once. So. Yeah, I'm not familiar with the with what's the actual content of the of the pat maths, to be honest. But I would think it would be maybe untimed, and so um, maybe might might systematically um, miss some some types of students with maths disabilities. Victoria's asked her that um, her son has dyslexia and dysgraphia, but is not in year three, not supported by learning support. Um, spoken to the school and how it affects him in class and he suffers anxiety. How do we seek NAPLAN exam uh, arrangements if the school isn't acknowledging any of this? Mm. Um, before you answer, I wonder whether there'll be NAPLAN next year. That's a political um, statement from me and it's just my personal opinion. I, I don't know that it will um, happen next year after the pause of this year. Um, but um, answer for that one. 
Yeah, look, that's really difficult. Um, look, just um, I, ideally what we want to work towards is a positive collaborative relationship with schools. Um, um, so I, I would just keep advocating and, and keep requesting and and um, upskill yourself on the, the Disability Discrimination Act and the, um, the education, Disability Education Standards and know your rights um, and, um, and just seek support um, from, from organisations like this, from professionals such as psychologists potentially to provide some guidance, um, potentially um, you know, attend a student support group meeting at the school. Um, so that's that's probably yeah what I would I would be recommending and just keep keep um you know keep up the fight. Unfortunately, it's not a straight and an easy easy path. Um, often that that journey has um has a lot of lot of hills. So Adina's has asked data driven from how far back in the educational history. Yeah, well, it could be anything. Look for students who are. Um, like I said, the VCAR requires that, that schools document these decisions um, and so I know parents certainly kind of take ownership of it and they'll keep um, emails um, from the school saying they're going to be given additional time in this and additional time in that. Um, if you're having student support group meetings, um, you know, once a term or possibly once a year to talk about the adjustments, you know, minutes of that meeting should be taken by someone at the school. So that would be um, um, the um, evidence, documented evidence. Um, Really, you probably just as soon as you realise that a student in high school has a learning disability, you might as well just be gathering some evidence every year. Um, but it, it might not be until kind of year nine where you get the kind of assessment and exam arrangements that are more similar to, to year 12 that you really can start to get that um, really good evidence that, that shows, you know, that they need that assistive technology um, potentially. Elaine asks, what if adjustments are requested by parent from year seven because we had an ADA assessment of dyslexia and dysgraphia from grade five. How can the school give evidence of things they noted and tried? I, I, um, I don't think the VCAR would accept an ADA assessment. Um, I'm, I'm not sure there is actually a cognitive test in there. So um, on the VCAR website, it very specifically um, um, list the tests that that um, VCAR will um, um, that have to be used. So it has to be a whisk, a weight, or um, a Woodcock Johnson um, was recently added in in 2018. Um, and so those tests have to be administered by psychologists. I'm not sure um, if ADA um, if those assessments are actually administered by psychologists. So that might be an instance where you might um, seek out an educational psychologist for um, and an updated assessment uh, or, the, or, or use the school psychologist if, if that option is available as well. Amanda's asked, is it possible that an ed psych might recommend accommodations without an actual SLD diagnosis? Would this still enable application to VCAA? Uh, yeah, potentially, because like I said, VCAR don't actually require that the student, you know, has a formal diagnosis on a piece of paper, because again, they're recognising that, you know, everyone's um, journey is different. Um, every, um, you know, so they're not going to systematically disadvantage um, students because they went to psychologist X. Um, who doesn't like to use that label versus, you know, psychologist Y, for example, or, um, but it's about showing the difficulty. So that's why I think that evidence, that, that school-based information can really, um, I, I think there has been a misperception that, that the psychological report part of that process is the most important part. And I really think it's not. I really think it's the educational evidence um, that really, um, has, has is kind of provides that tipping point um, for, for those um, applications that, that get approved and don't get approved. Um, so just because you have a psychological report um, that does provide a diagnosis of SLD and recommends these certain recommendations, that in and of itself um, is not going to um, lead to a successful application. Um, but if the school can, um, can show their evidence as well, um, then, then that's what's 
going to be more likely to, to lead to a successful application. Thanks, Kate. And um, Andrea has just uh, posted there, in New South Wales, the YARC cannot be conducted or submitted prior to the last term of year 11, as in term one of year 12. So thanks for that information, Yeah, that's Andrea. really important. Of, of, yeah, sorry, I, I probably didn't even think that there'd be LDA, there'd be people outside of Victoria. Oh, yeah. um, so obviously, I'm just talking about the Victoria situation and every state is a bit different. So it's, it's obviously really important to, to understand what the, the rules um, and the policy are in your state. All right. Well, Thank you so much, Kate. That there's such a wealth of information there um, that, that is so going to be so useful, I think, for so many of us. So I'd really like to thank you for putting that together and giving your time this evening. It's um, first you. rate. So so thank you so much. Uh, before you before you all um, leave, um, we we enjoyed Kate so much tonight. We've got another Kate next week. Um, so Kate De Bruin will be presenting uh, next week. Uh, Kate is the Graduate Research Coordinator and Lecturer for Inclusive Education at Monash University. Um, and she'll be talking about universal design principles to support learning, participation and progress for every student next week. So um, we'll have another Kate next week. But again, uh, Kate Jacobs, thank you so much. Uh, that was wonderful. Uh, this will go up on our YouTube channel. Um, hopefully in the next few days, hopefully smoothly. It's, it's been a little bit of a challenge for me, but um, thanks so much and we really appreciate it. And thanks to everybody for, for joining in tonight and hopefully we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Kate. No, not a problem. Wonderful. Did oh, good. So I'll, I'll um, email you through those slides as well yeah. now. Awesome. And um, and that's yeah. everything. Yeah, I'm just yeah. having a look yeah. through through some of the comments. Um, and I think we maxed out at about 92 people. Okay, great. Is, I mean, Lynn Stone said to me, um, "Shall we stop you know, the recording?" She, yeah, let's do that. Yep. Stop recording. Yeah.